<laughs> hey y'all, Theron and Maddie here. And in this workshop, I'm gonna walk you through my process and my thoughts about how I've created my personal work and then also how that's led into commercial projects and how I use a similar workflow for creating great images for clients. The thing that I hope that you get from this is that you understand and embrace that photography for it to be successful has to come from a place from the heart of a project that you love and you really care about, that it takes hard work, that it is this wonderful combination of craft and science and ideas, and that it does take dedication and love to make wonderful images, but it's all worth it. So this workshop is focused on personal projects. And the reason why we create large bodies of work is an opportunity to express to the world how you see things, and that lets you hone your style, which is ultimately something that art directors and brands are gonna see in your own portfolio and wanna bring you in to shoot that for the stories that they're trying to tell. Yeah, I can't wait to show you all how I create and how I worked, and hopefully you'll find something important and valuable in this that you can take into your own process of creating. And thanks for the opportunity to let me show you into a tiny little bit of our life. So one part about photography I'm a huge advocate of is to study the history of photography. And it's important as an image maker to understand where we came from, how influences of past image makers show up in our work today, and how in understanding that photography is a way of seeing. It's our responsibility to understand that we don't create images in a vacuum, that the past has influenced us. And it's an incredible place to get inspiration from. And there's, we'll link out to a bunch of photographers that I love as well. And one of them is William Eggleston. He's considered the father of uh, color photography. And he has a distinct style that now feels ubiquitous, but he invented that way of seeing. And it's a great place to launch from and understand how his work has shown up in commercial work over the years and influences us today. And I also love the FSA photographers. Um, they went out during the Dust Bowl of America and documented just the lives and stories of everyday people. And ultimately, photography is a tool for expressing how you see and feel about the world. It can be confusing because it's often so connected to what we would consider a reality. And that's because you can present a photograph in a court of law as an objective piece of truth, but the photograph is an interpretation. You come at with your own history, your own way of seeing, and turning the world from this 3D experience that's shared into a flat image that's two-dimensional becomes an object is not a fact, it's an interpretation of the world. And it's just good to have an understanding of where we fit in to the history of image making. Everyone needs to look at, check out from the library, or even own a copy of Robert Frank's The Americans. I mean, he set the tone for documenting America. He was an outsider coming in and sharing with how he saw American culture in that time. That's an incredible book. Um, Lee Friedlander's work, his street photography, deeply influential. Um, Irving Penn's portraiture work is incredible. Um, I love Dorothea Lange's work. She was an FSA photographer. She's an incredible image maker. Uh, Nicholas Nixon has a wonderful series of, he's been photographing the Brown sisters, uh, his wife and uh, her three sisters since the 70s all the way up to today. There's an incredible website now that you can go to. You can scroll through all the images as they progress over time. And that's uh, a wonderful example of how taking a personal body of work translates into commercial projects and communicating the same idea over a vast number of years over different photographs. Uh, another book that's been widely influential to me and other photographers over the years is Stephen Shore's Uncommon Places. And he's another image maker that really defined a way of seeing and feeling the world. 
And those books, you know, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, like they're really important to go look at because those are people who has helped us define how we take photographs today. And the biggest inspiration that I'm pulling in beyond looking at the history of photography is I love to support my friends and buy their books when they release a copy. And one only, not only are you supporting another photographer and contributing to their success, it's great to be ingesting, taking in new sounds and sights and touch and to see how other people are creating. Because again, we can't create in a vacuum. We have to inspire and work off of each other. And it's just, that's the part where critique in a community, support in a community, inspiration, feedback, financially supporting each other, buying our books, really is that holistic approach of being a successful image maker. So my philosophy on light and photography, I feel like it's very similar to every photographer's. And I would say that light is everything. But you can make great images in almost any type of lighting. And the go-to hero lighting is that golden hour, the long sunset, and that is an incredible time of day to shoot, to enhance a photograph, to really bring out that warmth and just good feelings on the inside. But an overcast day where the sun is a giant um, softbox because of all the cloud cover, is still a really wonderful and nice time to shoot. And that's when the light isn't gonna carry the images. That's when your concepts and your connection to the subject and the subject matter and what's happening with the talent in the photograph has to be stronger. That's when light isn't gonna be that like, turn it up to 11, take it to the next level, just hero shot. Uh, shooting on an overcast day can have its own advantages. And one of the biggest ones is like, you get a huge window of time to create. Whereas with the golden hour hero, lens flare coming through the lens. That's a much more narrow uh, time of day uh, to photograph in. So like the way that I think about photography is your concept and your idea for the images are the most important part of the photograph. Like that is your ownership of it. That's your vision. That's your heart. That's your connection. That's the story you have to tell. And then executing that idea is done through all the technical aspects and attributes of photography. And those are things that you should know and should talk about, but those aren't the pieces that you should get hung up on your image making. The lens, the camera, the f-stop, the aperture, the ISO, the technical details. And the best metaphor for that is a window. And this is how I think about photography. If we think about a window in your house, we can talk about the window itself. Who made the window? Is it double pane? Is it single pane? Is it painted? Does the window open? Those are all the technical attributes of photography. Or we can look through the window out into the world and talk about what we see. And to me, that's the deeper, longer lasting part about photography that's gonna keep you going as an image maker is the reason why you're shooting not the reasons how not the reason how you're shooting you know it's important to build a relationship with your subject and to put them at ease in the space the physical space the room the location you're shooting cuz um, you know, the goal of photography is to capture how you feel about the subject. And, you know, that is like a slight difference a lot of times, like we think about photography is that about capturing what we, what is present, or like what we think is reality. But, you know, photography has this way of transcending that. It actually is, is our opportunity as photographers to show how we see the world. So when you put your uh, subject at ease, that tension, is no longer visible in the space, your subject's gonna fall into place and move into like a more natural, relaxed existence. I think the thing to remember is when you are taking photographs, like in, in that space of taking photos, you're still living your life. And just meaning that um, you want to have the interaction, you know, be pleasant 
and you want to have a relationship built with them so they fall into place and are at ease and you can not capture the tension of like maybe of awkwardness. So just giving them time and space to get to know them just will allow you to capture those images that feel very natural and soft and flow. And that's really just done through time. You know, like the first thing that uh, you, you know, need to not do is pick up your camera. Like there's definitely a time of conversation and there's a time of using your camera and just kind of knowing internally the first set of images that you're gonna capture in a series are not gonna be your best shots. I mean, they could be, you know, when you go back and edit them, but just um, getting comfortable through shooting. And there's definitely a quantity thing where, you know, over time the energy drops, you know, people can let their guard down, more space to be vulnerable, and that's when you get great images. The relationship, like the, the, the time that I become most aware that the relationship between Maddie and myself like is important is when other people try to photograph her and they don't get the result that they're expecting. Um, and that's when they realize that it's, it's our interaction and a lot of my concepts for the photographs is what makes the images. Like it's, it's more than just picking up a camera and photographing a cute dog. It's, it's the bond and the trust plus the idea plus the photographic execution of the culmination of all that to make beautiful images. So that's why if you're photographing your own dog or whatever subject is in front of your camera is building trust is super important. And also, you know, doing something that they respond and like to, you know, with like, with a dog, it would obviously be probably like using treats or toys. Uh, with humans, it would be saying kind things and not being rude. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much like in, in like the big picture about it, it's just building relationships. And that is letting go of the ego of self and just asking engaging questions and, you know, also being sincere in your interest. Yeah, it's so like the way I established trust when I was like photographing essentially strangers who like hopefully became, you know, much more familiar friends by the end. Um, you know, part about it, part of that process is approaching people with eye contact, um, with, you know, a camera visible that, you know, is not overwhelming, but does like look professional. Um, you know, DSLR type camera. Um, and also just a willingness to hear no. You know, that's the biggest part about it. All you can do is approach and ask and be friendly and kind of like walk around with like with your palms up. Like if your energy is approaching people like this, I mean, you know, probably don't physically walk up to people like this. That'd be a bit odd. Is like your, but your body, you're carrying different energy versus like when you're doing this, like this reads and feels so different. And all that energy is internalized and projected and, you know, seeps out of us. So just when we walk up to people and we're feeling soft and engaging, you know, they can read that non-verbally. Uh, and then again, you know, just let them know what you're doing. And often a business card will even help that has your name, your phone number, your website kind of legitimizes and, you know, kind of like solidifies um, you know, that you exist and, you know, there's a connection there with the, with the card. They feel like they can, you know, find you again if they ever had to. Um, but then again, also be okay hearing no. And um, I had a professor in school, you know, that told me that in my career, I'm gonna hear way more no's than yeses. And, you know, I think that's the part about all this is the big story is this persistence and uh, seeing the idea through. The importance of the personal project is that that is what is going to help shape and define your style. Committing to a single idea and seeing it visually 
come to life through creating images. And ultimately, establishing a body of work and a style is what art directors and creative directors at agencies and brands that hire photographers to create content, that's what they're gonna look to. And you have to create the type of work that you wanna get hired for. So the tipping point where I started to get hired for commercial work from and out of creating personal projects was over 10 years ago now. And you know that journey and story for me obviously intersected with the rise in popularity with Instagram. And we were early adopters uh, to the platform. And the biggest thing that we were doing was sharing content out of pure joy, out of love for creating images. So like it definitely was tied to passion and interest in what I was doing and other photographers uh, you know, around me were doing at that time and just sharing those images on a consistent basis. And you know, that was the biggest piece of it. Like we weren't necessarily creating because we wanted to be famous or you know, to get rich. We were doing it because we truly loved image making. We loved photography and it was our creative output for the world, for our life. It's like the stories that we wanted to tell, they were important to us. Um, but you know, that also does intersect commercial. Like you also want to make a living and a life out of creating images. Like there's no greater blessing for someone to see an image that you made and love it and say like, I want you to execute similar ideas and a similar style and vision for our brand to help us tell our story. Like that's the biggest reward being a photographer. Essentially what happened was we were out shooting images in the world because we loved being photographers and Insta Instagram came around, uh, a platform for sharing photographs. We started using it and initially it wasn't taken seriously as a platform and we made it into like a platform to be taken seriously for the world's best photography and still images and now that is Instagram. So what happened was, you know, we were in our early 20s sharing images and a lot of people that were following us were of course younger than us at the time. You know, those same kind of stories hold true for, for TikTok and YouTube today. And then, you know, we aged and got older and that group of people who maybe were in middle school or high school following us in the early days, you know, they grew up, they went to college, they graduated, they got job at ad agencies, and now they're responsible for social media, which is this new booming industry that maybe some of the old timers in the, um, in the field aren't in sync with as much. So they started to get budgets. And those people decided like, hey, I want to hire the people that I've been following since I was like 12 years old. I know, which is like blows my mind to think about, but um, that's like my best you know, analysis of what happened. And it's like, you know, it's been amazing. I don't, you know, I don't know, cut here, but I don't know if it's repeatable again. You know, I think whatever it is, I think it's gonna be something new and different, you know, like, yeah, like the components of turning personal work into successful commercial work are the same across a lot of different mediums. Um, but it's also like not a guarantee. Like there's, I think the best analogy that like we're kind of aware of um, broadly in our culture is like, you know, this idea of like the starving artist or like the musician who's like playing coffee shops and like trying to land gigs or, you know, with, with an actor uh, doing the same thing. So like there's no guarantee for success, but there are components that are required to even enter into the space and pursuing that passion. And the biggest one is like, you just have to love what you're creating. It has to come from a place of pure joy. You have to care about the subject and you have to really care about what you're saying. Like you can't be disingenuous with it. You can't uh, be trying to create something because you think it's the, like you like, oh, that's the right thing to do. Like you have to love it in your core and believe in it. Like that's number one. And the second one, and there is consistency to it. You have to do it frequently. It has to be a challenge. It can't come easy because all that low hanging fruit has already been picked and to stand out and to be unique. I don't think you have to be extreme and over the top, but you do have to find a niche and say something new and unique that is still important to what's going on in culture today. And like the space that I found myself in, and I fell into it because like I love dogs and I love my dog Maddie and our relationship 
And that came from a place of just something that was happening in my life. Like I didn't, and here's the difference. Like I didn't sit out and go like, oh yeah, people love dog photos and like I can capitalize on that. The origins of it was like, I love my dog, she's with me, so therefore I'm gonna photograph and document her. And it grew organically. And like the best analogy I have for that is like a restaurant analogy. It's that story of like someone who loves to cook, they start out in other people's kitchen, they take a risk, they buy their own food truck, they start out small, and they're dedicated to that food truck. They're there every Friday, every Saturday, week after week after week, making amazing food and the business grows and more people come. And then one day they take another risk and then they buy their little corner bistro. Now they have like a corner physical space and their restaurant grows from there. And that kind of same analogy is true uh, for photography and for, for making images. Be becoming known for a certain type of work is uh, it's definitely a double-edged sword, and, and it's very much analogous to like the actor getting and getting typecast. And I think ultimately, like the place to land with it is, you know, just being grateful to get to create photographs and shoot for brands. Like that's like the biggest reward if photography is something that you love. And the kind of the double-edged sword part about it is like you need to develop a style to become recognizable for yourself and for others because that is how you're gonna differentiate yourself in a really large sea of other people that wanna be pursuing the craft as well. And you have to make images that are gonna stick in art directors' minds um, at agencies or you know brands direct so they will think of you and come up in their mind when uh, they have projects that come through their desk and you know, like you have to create the work that you want to get hired for. And the reason that's important is because that is how you're going to be identified to art directors and brands. Like they are going to see your style, they're going to think of you for the project, and they are going to be able to pull up their screen and see the exact feelings and images that they want to bring into their campaign that they're shooting. I think like most great ideas, um, it, it was a little bit of a slow ramp up. So I photograph, I keep saying it, so I'm just, <clears throat> so I photographed the project with my, here's how it went down. I photographed the project with my grandfather, went back uh, to Idaho to my job, decided to leave that job and just go start anew. And the first iteration of it was like, okay, well, I'm actually gonna go do this, you know, photograph me and photograph someone like my, my grandfather, just intersect their life for 30 days and um, I named that project This Wild Idea because I was like, oh, that's kind of a wild idea when like you're traveling just to uh, try to meet people and tell a couple hours of their story where you where you kind of just bumped into them into the world. Like someone you never knew existed that day before you woke up. And I did that for 30 days. And, um, you know, I was at that time I was sharing it on a, a WordPress blog site that um, me and my buddy had built. It's very simple. Uh, place for the photos to land and Wired Magazine on their Twitter account retweeted the project. And I was like, oh, like that's the first time anyone had ever acknowledged that my work existed outside of um, people, you know, I was immediately around, be it professors or friends. And, you know, I think anytime you get celebrated for doing something, you're like, well, I'm going to do that a lot more because I love it when dad says I did a good job. And that's exactly what I did. I think, you know, that, that you know, obviously can become very unhealthy, but it also can be a, a great drive. And for me, I was like, I'm on to something. Let me keep going with this. And that's when I dug deep and found, uh, you know, the resources to, to go do this project for an entire year. You know, obviously, like having funding for ideas uh, for your project is really important. And, you know, there's a couple layers to this. And, you know, just to my story of how I made this happen. Um, one, it was a very different season in my life. I was far younger. You know, I was in my early 20s. And, you know, I felt 10 feet tall, like I could do anything. You know, was never worried about, you know, any kind of debt or owning a house. Uh, I just like was very free and open season of life and uh, willing to take a lot of risk. And in that chapter of my life, it was far more important to make sure I was creating something I really cared about than what the future 
was going to bring or like trying to like obtain any kind of like financial security. So like that was just in that season of life, which, um, you know, was the perfect time to wander and to make something that I really enjoyed. So my funding came from two places. One, um, I worked and saved my own, you know, my own money uh, to spend on the road. And the other uh, I used was uh, Kickstarter, which, you know, I don't know if I want to be critical of Kickstarter, but like at that time, it really was uh, very much a platform to fund creative ideas. Um, you know, now it seems like maybe like a little bit more like industrial design focused, uh, pre-ordering, um, you know, wonderful and valuable things, you know, board games or uh, video games or, you know, some gadget for, you know, a camera or uh, a phone. But in that like early chapter of uh, Kickstarter, it really felt like people had uh, creative projects that they wanted to go do and shoot, and they could you know find funding through friends. So I posted you know this 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 wild idea, three sixty five story, and uh, you know just shot a sh simple video for it that I wanted to go to all fifty states, photograph one story a day every day, post it, and uh, travel the country. So it was a way that. Uh, through that, I think I raised, we could say around 15 grand. So I think that first year on the road, I lived off, you know, with gas and food and sleeping in my truck about $20,000. Um, and part of the reason that I think I was able to get funding, and most of it was through people I had known or my friend's very generous parents, um, was because the project wasn't easy. It had scale, it had an objective, and ultimately I saw it through. So literally that entire year, I met one person I didn't know, photographed them, recorded a short story of their voice, and then that night I would post it on my website. And the next day I would get up and I would be like, I need to go meet somebody else. As like I'm traveling, you know, small back roads of America. And um, it just made me incredibly uncomfortable and it also like challenged me with um, becoming comfortable with asking people that I didn't know to take their photos. Like, and, like the the important components of the this Wild idea project were um, scale. It had parameters, and it wasn't easy. And like I'd never met anyone else that had done a project in that capacity. Like Robert Frank traveled America and made some of the most compelling images uh, as an outsider of how he saw America. So his project, Americans had scale and parameters and I needed that for mine. But I, I think with, with, the, with taking on a personal project, um, like you have to try to like meet the zeitgeist of the day and make sure like you're attempting to be relevant. Um, yeah, it's very much akin to um, opening a restaurant, like here in 2020, 2021, probably not the best idea to open a cupcake shop. I don't you know, like, I don't know, like that, maybe that, you know, I'm okay being wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't be so divisive with this, these kind of things. I don't want to offend anyone trying to open a cupcake shop today. It could be their dream and they should live their dream. But, um, I don't know. Maybe this has, maybe this is true. Um, I'm trying to only speak for myself, okay. Um, <laughs> so like, I think it's, it's just critically important for the project not to be easy, you know? Not to be physically easy. There has to be a challenge to overcome. And that's what my project provided was, the scale was just enormous. And I was committing to do it for a whole year. And in the end, I saw it through. And I went to all 50 states. I photographed 365 people. I edited their stories. I posted their stories. I put a blurb of them sharing their voice online and just really celebrated everyday Americans. And that was just the right mix and the right current of what was going on in the moment. And I think that was 2012. And if we could backtrack and kind of look at the swirl of images being made at the time, like that chapter in advertise definitely was very much like documentary focused everyday focus not using professional models uh and like that was the 
impetus for advertising the next couple years after that. And so I that that was like one of those like right place, right time, right passion, where I just intersected what was going to be happening commercially to happening uh, personally with my own work. And that was in the end t still tied to I wasn't doing it to get commercial work. It's really tied to I love the idea and I believed in the idea and I made the project. You know, part of taking on that large scale project, like I, uh, the, the, this why I did a 365, 50 state project, like for me to go create a body of work, I looked back at all these uh, photographers in the history of image making in photography and looked at all the FSA photographers, Dorothy Lang, Walker Evans, um, you know, guys like William Eggleston and um, Lee Freelander. Um, there's this great image like where he photographed like his mirror in his car and it just has all these layers. And when you look at their work, it's presented in large bodies of work where they've developed a style and you can tell that uh, they are the ones that shot the image. And um, I knew that, yeah, for me to get any traction uh, and for a project to be shareable, because you know my goal was to make work that other people wanted to see and be involved in and follow along. Um, I knew that it couldn't be easy. It had to be a challenge. It had to be something that no one had ever done before. And when taking on a personal project and giving yourself assignment, I think that is important. And you know, it can feel daunting or feeling like we're in a space where everything's been done, everything's been said, um, which I, you know, which is like a little bit of like a postmodernist like, you know, dilemma. But um, you know, I think in the end, it's not true. And there's still room to share with the world how you see things. And that's the beauty in photography. It's a way of seeing. And I knew that part of the recipe for a successful personal project was for it to be a challenge. It couldn't be on the nose. It couldn't be something that everybody else was running out wanting to do. It had to be something unexplored and at a scale that was difficult. So doing that project every single day of my life for a whole year, it really gave the project legitimacy. And by month eight, nine, 10, 11, you know, it just, it just grew. And I was just getting ton of traffic to the website at that point. And I think at its peak, um, it was like one month it had like a terabyte of data being pulled off of it just from people loading the images on their um, personal website, which was a huge server bill at the time for me because I definitely, I was like, I think that might've been a little bit pre Amazon S3, but I just, I like my, the data plan that I had paid for it, it just far exceeded it. And um, that was a, a funny lesson to learn. Um, but I think the world is different now with that kind of, um, with pricing. But, uh, you know, like having something that was shareable in scale, you could follow along be involved with and check in on every day, just made the project shareable and it kept it fresh day after day. And it wasn't something stagnant that you shoot and post done. It was an ongoing project. It was like a, you know, the recipe for a, like a TV channel or a TV show or a YouTube channel where you're constantly going updates. It was that same idea, but in the form of something that I loved, which was still photography. So that, um, that, that project having just like being really bold and not easy gave it visibility. You know, ultimately the project was named National Geographic's Travel Project of the Year, which at the end of this year of doing this project, I was like grateful and ecstatic. You know, I ended in Hawaii and uh, it was also kind of like, I didn't know what I was gonna do next. Like, then I felt very, like I instantly lost my sense of purpose. Like, cause I was doing something every day, now it's finished, and like, what's next? So like, having National Geographic fly out to Hawaii, tell me, like, I won this award, and they photographed me, and they told my story, just like, neatly encapsulated everything, and it became my graduation.
and it just kind of like legitimized it and it just felt so fulfilling to have uh, obviously an organization that I admire and you know have forever wanted to be published in kind of tip their hat to me and acknowledge that I existed and like what I created was valuable to somebody else and that was really fulfilling and that like just went like man like I just spent this year of my life doing something really worthy and I know that that would not have come together if I was just like yeah I'm just gonna like casually maybe sometimes photograph like one person in my town if I'm feeling like it you know like I really had to go all in and make it what I was gonna do with my time for that year yeah so I mean that's my uh, my story, like, you know, it, it started with uh, the foundation of it was like a love for photography. And then it was taking a love for photography and wanting to find growth as an image maker through a personal project. And then I took those personal projects and made that into my commercial career. I want to distill down some of the elements that are important to have a successful and lasting personal project. And the biggest one is that it can't be easy. And because if it's something easy, it's most likely already been created. And that ties into the second uh, big goal of a great personal project is that you want to focus on a topic that you feel is underrepresented or could um, be amplified by your voice and your images contributing to telling the story. You really have to care and be passionate about the subject that you're photographing. And um, it is a really beautiful intersection of, um, of passion, of hobby and personal interest. And for you to wake up and shoot something day after day, it has to be relevant and important to you in your life. Yeah, and you know, the, the intersection of uh, personal work and commercial work is that uh, taking on a focused and dedicated personal project gives you an opportunity to hone your style and your vision for creating images. And that, in turn, is what you'll be hired for commercial work. Because art directors and creative directors are gonna see the past work that you've created and they're going to interpret that to fit a commercial project that they need fulfilled. So you, in the end, you have to make the work that you want to get hired for. And that's like, I mean, that's just like so true. Like, you know, cause a lot of photographers and, and myself included, like are like, I could shoot anything that anyone asked me to do, but we all get, uh, uh, I can't think, I can't say the word right now. Hey, we, 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 yeah, pigeonhole. We all get put into like little compartments and, you know, like just like most chefs could likely cook any dish when you, uh, you, when you think about restaurants in the context of their menu, not that they have the ability to cook anything. And the same thing is true with photography and art directors is that when they think of you, they're going to think of your style and they're going to see the past work that you've proven you're capable of and what you can build and photograph. And then you're gonna get hired based on that. So it's like so imperative to make the type of work that you wanna get hired for. So, I mean, if you, you know, you're shooting landscapes because you, you know, you wanna get hired to shoot landscapes, that's great. But if you don't love doing it, you know, that's, that's gonna, you know, you know, I don't know. It's just phony, it's gonna float to the surface. And the beautiful thing about the personal project is you've essentially hired yourself to create something that you love and care about. And it's free from, um, you know, commercial restraints. Uh, and the creative and art director on the project is yourself. And, you know, then, you, of course, you can tap your community for feedback and review of the images you're creating. But it does give you a ton of space, like the, the taking on the personal project gives you a lot of space to take risk and to fail and to figure out what doesn't work. Like, I'm trying to think of where this comes from. You know, I don't know. It's just like, it comes from like, you just like love photography and like the way to get better at being a photographer is taking 
lots of photographs. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of photographs. Like you have to put in the time. And the shortcut to it all is not the volume of work that it takes, but the shortcut is making sure that you are focused and honed in when you're shooting images, not to just be random about it and hoping to capture hero single one-off photographs, but you become a wise photographer when you can execute the same idea across a broad range of images over time. You know, that's when you've become successful in the craft. Yeah, and it's also important to realize that a lot of times the discovery, so like the, the impetus for going to shoot work could be like, I wanna tell the story of my town, right? Which is like really general and huge, and you, you know, anything could fit into that. But a lot of times like the place to start is if you don't have the honed in idea. Like if you're like, I wanna photograph the play, the, like tell the story of my town. A lot of times what you need to do is to go forth and create, put in the time and the hard work to capturing the images, make sure you're dedicating yourself to capturing the town in the best light, obviously the best time of day, uh, finding the right locations and the people to photograph. But a lot of times the story will evolve and become more clear through the editing process. So you have to go shoot the images, then edit them, and then when you've sat down and reviewed your images, that informs you of how to go photograph and shoot the next day. So like with my personal project, this one idea, day one was awkward and uncomfortable, and I'm, I'm like, where do I put my hands? And you know, like I just had to go like, I'm doing this, I have to be uncomfortable. And I just walked up to this lovely couple in their front yard doing gardening. I was like, hey, my name is Theron, I'm doing this, uh, crazy project. I'm going to all 50 states. Can I like hang out with you and take some photos? They're like, okay. And it was uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable to ask. It made them uncomfortable to say yes. But ultimately, it led us both somewhere like really beautiful, you know? Because like years later, I have people emailing me like, thank you so much for like photographing my friend. Uh, you know, I didn't have any photographs of them. They've passed away now. Like you're the last person to take images of them. So like that's like the intersection of um, being uncomfortable, taking on, on you know a project that's not easy, but also, you know, as time went on for from day one versus day three hundred, I was a far better photographer because I'd been doing it for three hundred days, day after day. And I became more comfortable walking up to ask people. And I became more aware of the time of day I was shooting and the environments I was shooting. Uh, because I had a bunch of failures in the project. Like some days were super duds. Like uh, some days were not exceptional. The locations were great. The people were stiff. I, you know, couldn't drop my guard to be present with them. And, you know, that it was like the process of creating that you become better. You gotta, you gotta burn a bunch of burgers, you know, if you want to become a good cook, you know. <laughs> yeah, so like finding, you know, um, inspiration in photographing the same subject uh, over and over again to create a body of work in the personal project, uh, you know, for, for, you know, if we're focused on like the, the this one, the 365 project was that um, the subject matter was always the same, it was like a person's story that day, but what gave it new inspiration was that it was always in a new setting and location. And over time, through creating the work, you become more aware of the magic of what makes uh, setting and location interesting. And it's just through the creation of shooting and editing that's how I found, I don't know, that's how I got better. I don't know, like I'm trying to say it in an interesting way. I don't know, like I took a bunch of photos and a lot of them sucked. And then like the next day I was like, well, what sucked about that image? Like what's not speaking to me? Like these are, what's up? Because like some of this like feels like really ineffable, right? Like there's no like, it's not like, um, 
you know, it's not it's not like a recipe in the sense of like everything is spelled out. It's something untangible. You know, it's like light and setting and mood. Um, and it was like doing it day after day to become aware of it, of what's not working. Um, so finding new inspiration for me was creating lots of images that weren't, that didn't have that magic and then continuing to push into the topic, you know? So like I knew the idea was good. Like I committed to it and I was gonna see it through. So I think there, there very much is that important part about it. And then being inspired for me in that in that context, that specific project was that I was gonna do it better the next day. You know, I was gonna find more compelling subjects. I was gonna take greater risk in who I walked up to and asked for permission to like intersect their life. And that was the drive of it. So like it was all based around a love for creating images. Yeah, you know, some of the early mistakes that I made when I was taking on uh, commercial projects was um, taking them uh, too personally. So like the, the, the difference was, uh, was that I was getting hired by brands often to uh, shoot images for them, but then put them on my personal feed on my Instagram. It's a weird thing to get hired for a brand because they like your work and then they want to try to control and dictate what you're doing, but they're hiring you because they like like what you do. So like, I know what's best. Like, it's on my feed. Let me do my thing. And they're like, no, more product. I was like, well, that's like really not gonna, you know, that's not gonna translate well. So like, it was this tension. Like if, if you're just hiring by, being hired by a brand and they, liked your images and they were gonna go put them on billboards or their website, like that's no big deal. But to like the, the, your personal Instagram page is kind of like this representation of you. Like it was something, I don't know, it's not really sacred. It's just, um, it's much more personal. It's like your, your vision. The early mistakes that we made were not being, the early six that I made was just not being more amicable with brands. Uh, on my own feed. You know, I think there's a time to set boundaries and like, um, you know, really stand up for yourself and like protect like your personal feed. Uh, and there's also a space to acknowledge that, you know, you're being hired and you're grateful for the funding uh, to shoot something for a brand. This is about, you know, posting images on your own channels and you know, I think for me, like I was coming from a place where the work was so personal, like that I like, it was like my ideas and my visions, like I very, I was very protective of it. And, you know, I think that when lots of people are grabbing at you and trying to get a little piece of you, it can make you a little bit defensive. And I think that, you know, now that I'm older, I think I could have navigated that and handled it a little bit better and just been like more amicable. Like instead of, I think it's, it's, I think there's like a way, oh, come say hi, Maddie. You gonna come up here? Come on. No, thanks. Um, oh, I got the dog. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, you're gonna take your collar off. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is like me being honest. Like, you know, I think, you know, I think, yeah, like, what's the big, what's the big lesson? Like, you know, I think early on, um, when we were getting hired for commercial projects based on the personal work that we were making, I would have like advocated a little bit stronger in those moments to try to break into the space for creating for brands that had nothing to do with our personal channels. And, you know, initially, the stuff that we were getting hired for was to shoot for brands and then to post it on our personal Instagram, which, you know, still happens to this day. And, you know, anytime that work comes through, it can be very grateful. But I wish, uh, you know, like 10 years earlier in these conversations with the ad agencies and the brands, like we're like, hey, let's also concurrently, um, you know, shoot this social campaign you have, but let's tie it into a photo shoot 
where we're creating assets for you. And that, you know, that slowly happened over time to start advocating for that and like getting the extra budget. Um, but I just kind of wish that we were doing it sooner and pushing stronger for it. You know, it's a part of, you know, what I do now uh, when I get hired for jobs. Um, and that's, I think, the, the best part of being a commercial photographer is getting to shoot brands. And then they go, you know, out and use those assets that you've created, you know, billboards and out of home and, um, you know, digital and web, of course. The big lessons I learned taking on commercial work was just the joy in collaborating with other people. And I think photography at its best and most lasting and what's gonna keep a career going is not the just the individual photographer out there alone taking photographs. Like getting to work with a team and also getting to stretch yourself creatively. Cause whenever you get a brief, a creative brief from a brand, that is an assignment. It's a charge to take their needs and to go out and to fulfill it. And that's like the most fun, creative challenge. It's a scavenger hunt. It's an opportunity to work your brain and to make some new images. And then getting paid for it is just the best thing ever because that's gonna give you free time to go out and reinvest in your own personal projects. And that's kind of the cycle of it. It's like make work you love, try to get exposure for it so brands and ad agencies can see it. And then you shoot commercial projects and you get funding and then you like, inject that funding back into your life. You, you, know, you pay rent, you buy a new camera, you have new personal project ideas, you go out and shoot those. So it is the cycle of creating, getting funding and creating more. And this all has to just be based off, you know, pure love of photography. Like, that's, the, that's the way that it's sustainable. Like you just have to love uh, making photos. My personal world and commercial world has blurred together and they definitely are not like hardly defined all the time. Uh, you know, most of my work commercially these days, there is a division in that I'm like shooting for brands and often I'll post two to three photographs uh, on my personal channels for that, uh, you know, ad campaign, you know, the social campaign. And then I'm also creating a library of photographs for the brand that has nothing to do with me um, you know, necessarily me as a person or, or Maddie, and that's more like the self-produced side. So that line is much more defined in that I need to give the client, what to say, 30 photographs for their usage. And obviously, and most often that'll include, um, you know, full digital rights where they can publish it, you know, unlimited for two years digitally. And that's the big line of my work now in you know that blurs together in that I'm shooting images for my own channel my own story and then concurrently I'm going to create a library of photographs for them and I think the way to get work doing that for me was obviously you know my own social personal channel but then on my website which is like where people will go uh, to get my contact information my phone number my email uh, I'm posting images that I want to get hired for, lifestyle photographs or, you know, nature or, or vehicle images. I'm posting all the images that can like fill in the gaps that I can show the brand that I can create more than just a cute image with Maddie. And that's a great tool to upsell brands as well. Like if you get approached to shoot a project, they're like, we have X budget, we would love you to help promote our brand on your social media. I'm like, well, let's like tack on, you know, a self-produced photo shoot for an extra, you know, X amount. And then you guys can use those images for your own digital needs. And that's like a really great upgrade that I often try to like pitch brands when I'm talking to them. I'm so often hired um, to create images for brands for my social channel because they like what I've done and they wanna help tell the story of their product interject into my personal channel. And my challenge as a photographer has been like, I'm capable of shooting so much more and shooting anything, like hire me to shoot those projects. So like that's definitely been the niche and the like getting pigeonholed into that. And you know, a lot of actors 
uh, probably feel the same way that that's happened to them. But ultimately, like it's remembering to be grateful that you are having the opportunity to create images and everything is on schedule. And then it's also positioning yourself to create what you do want to work. So when a brand will come to me and be like, hey, we want you to shoot two photographs uh, of our product for on your Instagram page, I can say thank you. Like, I would love to do that. You know, that will provide me funding to keep making more images and living as a photographer. But then I'm also like, hey, let's tack on a self-produced lifestyle shoot, you know, for 20 or 30 grand, I can go out there and make you a library of images that you can use, have full digital use and rights to, and use them however you need and you want. And I can do it for a lesser amount of money that it would take you to hire a full crew to do it. They're gonna have a lighter feel. They're gonna be more airy and free and open. The client does have to let go a little bit of control because they won't be there on set. Uh, art directing every single detail, but they get a really big library of photographs to use as they want for a much smaller amount of money. You know, being burned out is, yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> you know, it's a real thing. I think it's, uh, you have to be aware of it. You have to like honor the space and the time that you're at and because uh, what happens with photography is to really see an idea through, you have to be persistent and you have to do it consistently and you need to do it for a long time. And that's the pathway to growth. But you also have to be aware and listen, you know, to your body and your spirit when it's just like, hey, take a step back and just like listen and slow down maybe this is not the moment, you know, to pick up your camera. And, you know, that's a way that, you know, I have felt, you know, many times before. And, uh, you know, I think the most important thing is like not to be discouraged in that. And then it's like, how do we get re-inspired, reinvigorated, and what does the journey need to look like uh, to come back photog to photography? And, uh, if it's just a, a short break that I need to make where like I'm feeling like stuck in a rut at a dead end, a lot of times what I'll do is go revisit uh, a photograph that I took a couple years ago and try to execute it in a better way, either technically or hone in the concept a little bit finer and just make a better image. Maddie's taking a bath. Is this cool? <laughs> yeah. Totally cool. Just taking a bath on camera, Maddie? <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, everyone's watching. Doesn't care. Oh, to be a dog. Yeah, and, and you know, this has happened a couple of times in um, the past couple of years where I just kind of like, I feel like I had a, hit a dead end creatively and just didn't know where to go next. And I'll go back and look through like, you know, the old portfolio and the places that have come and, you know, feel really proud and like make sure I'm like, I'm looking in, in the mirror and saying there's things like, I am enough, like I, you know, enjoy creating images. And then I'll find a photograph that um, I really love that could maybe be revisited again. So like, you know, three, four years later, I'll take that same concept. So I'll like repeat myself again, but intentionally and see if I can hone it in, make it technically sharper, uh, make it in a better setting and just um, see if I can um, shoot it again and see how I've changed and grown as an image maker over the past couple of years. And if I can do it, you know, better or in a new way and then use that as a new uh, launching platform. Because like one of the things that, you know, photographers often don't want to do is just get in a rut of like repeating yourself over and over again, where you feel like, you know, you're just on a groundhog day of posting the same kind of content. Like you want to grow and hone and, you know, become a better image maker by not just like revisiting the same idea again and again. It's like the same thing with a band. Like, you know, you can be very grateful for, you know, your, your breakout hit song, but you still want to go out there and play your new material and, you know, keep evolving as an artist. And the same thing is true for photographers, but sometimes it's really fun to go back in and remaster something you've already taken before. And that's a really fun thing uh, that I've discovered, you know, that I just enjoy doing. The, the, the thing with 
you know, taking on the personal project is that persistence has to be a huge part of it. It's it's one of the biggest things to the recipe for success. It doesn't guarantee success, of course, because any creative endeavor is um, a risk, you know, or maybe even a risk of, um, you know, putting yourself out there and it not being received like you wanted to. And But if you do find yourself feeling, um, a little tired and exhausted from it. There is a moment when there can be a lot gained by leaning into it and being uncomfortable and seeing if you can push through it. And, you know, discovering, you know, how to read true burnout versus just maybe leaning more towards the lazy side is like a nuanced conversation you'll have with yourself. But there definitely is a beauty to be found in pushing and leaning into the hard parts about it and seeing it through. And, you know, with, with, a, with a project where I gave myself such a lofty goal of, you know, all 50 states in 365 days, there were, you know, lots of days where um, I was, you know, exhausted and didn't want to keep going. But, you know, and there were be some days where, like, I would actually meet and photograph two people on one day. I don't know if I should, am I, am I, am I peeking behind the curtain too much here? But, you know, I would meet, like, when I was, like, my my energy was feeling high. I would meet somebody in the morning and then in the afternoon I just encountered somebody and the light was beautiful and I would, you know, photograph two stories a day and then the next day all I have to do is is post post their story and I can take a little break and a day off and then keep going. So, you know, I think there's like the parameters of it are like to understand like you're not here to beat yourself up and be cruel to yourself, be gentle, be loving, but have a goal and stick to it. But also like have room for grace and movement where, you know, sticking to a strict regimen is a good thing, but it's also within certain boundaries of like loving and being kind to yourself. So brands reach out to me through email and that's really important to have that website that uh, establishes your portfolio. You as a person. So having your website really feel like it's not just an anonymous photographer, but like you as an individual, that is your site. You really have to personalize it. Much like the like YouTube these days, like it's really personality based and you want to make sure that like your website is communicating obviously your visual story of your images, but also you as a human. So when someone lands on it, it's not anonymous. They get a feel for you, they get a feel for your work. And that is going to be your best professional contact. Like all the brands and agencies that have budgets to you know, help you go out there and create, it's going to be uh, them dropping you an email. Once in a while, like I will do uh, a cold outreach or a cold call to a brand that I really love that I want to collaborate with. And that's definitely a space where you're going to have to be comfortable with way more no's than yeses. Um, but it is a, a good way to spend you know, it can be a good way to spend some of your time. Like, and again, like most often it just doesn't connect because, and, and that's okay. Cause once in a while it does, and that makes it worth it. But what it is is people at agencies and brands, you know, they want to have as much creative decisions and control as you do as a photographer. They want to feel like they made something, they made decisions. You know, they don't want to feel like they're just people that are passing out money and funding to image makers. They're part of the creative process as well. So that's why when you get contacted and reach out to the company, that is going to be the most fruitful time to translate that into hired work. But you never know. Like, you really don't. Like, a brand could be looking at your images and you dropping them an email sparks a conversation. And that happened to me with the, this is 2021. Um, I just finished building uh, my second my second home. Um, I sold my first home. <laughs> I'm not a multiple home owner. Um, and I dropped this furniture company, Room and Board, and I love their, their products and their catalogs are amazing. And I need to furnish a new home and I just, I found the uh, the marketing director's email and I dropped her an email. I was like, hey, I love your stuff. You know, I would love to see if there's room for us to work together on furnishing my new house and we can take photographs of it. It can be a mini photo studio. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you emailed me. I've been watching your house build. I would love to work with you. And I was like, how serendipitous. Like that's when it can make sense and it is worthwhile um, to reach out.
the way I've been able to like, you know, keep my niche and show brands that I'm capable more is that separation between um, my Instagram account, uh, which I'm like posting very personal work. But the hope in doing that is that people, agencies, brands, they will see that and say like, oh, I love that feeling. He's capable of capturing and telling that type of story. We should hire him. But then also using my website as a place to show a much broader and holistic work of all the images I love creating and I'm capable of creating. But you still have to remember the images that you're sharing, whatever platform they are, social, website, those images that you're sharing, you have to realize that that is, you have to post the type of images that you wanna get hired for because that is what they are seeing. That is the, you know, the content that you're making. That's what you're capable of. So it's just important to keep that in mind. Who I decide to work with commercially, and especially if it's a uh, brand that's gonna like flow through my feed and I'm gonna be, you know, exposing, you know, their product to like my, through my social channels and also creating content uh, for their channels, for their usage. Like you, you have to like morally believe in it, right? And that's like gonna be like the most authentic and the most real images that you're gonna make. Like if it's something that you think is wrong and you don't believe in, like your heart when you're taking that photographs, like you're gonna know that. So the biggest job I've ever turned out, and I can be very frank about this, I'm fine sharing it, um, which it was hard to say no to, but it was the right decision. So um, a cigarette company approached me and they had a, a new vape, uh, vaping product coming out and they offered me $100,000 to post two images to my social channel. And that's probably the hardest job I've ever turned down because it would have been very easy and quick to do, and I think just the world would have moved on. You know, I think there would have been some negative backlash. Um, ultimately, it was the right thing to turn down because that's not something I wanna be promoting. Even though that product, I have no doubt, has helped a lot of people like move on from smoking into something better. It's been a good step for uh, people. That's just not something that I needed to, to promote personally. That one, that one was tough to say no to. <laughs> that was a lot of money. $100,000, yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of money. Um. <laughs> Biggest thing that you know helps you determine if the project is viable or not is discovering what the budget is and knowing if their scope fits what's possible, what they want to achieve. And you know, that's gonna, you know, that's just gonna vary based on, you know, where you're at with your career, if you're super hungry and just starting out, or if you're further along and, um, you know, you're only gonna take on bigger projects. And that's like true through any um, career in any um, field that you're working in. You know, even if you're a home builder, you know, when you first start out, you're gonna work for much less. And then as you gain talent and skills and reputation and become better in your craft, you're gonna take on larger and better projects. And that's just a natural curve uh, of any career in any field. Uh, and then once you've established the budget and essentially you just need to really honor yourself in that, like what are you willing to work for and you know how hungry are you? And does that give you enough room to cover your expenses, to pay taxes on that income and then still create something and, and earn a profit for your own life to keep going forward and to make more work? So the big piece of having a successful self-produced uh, photo shoot where you're creating a library of images for a brand is one, to have them uh, be obviously very involved and also invested in it. So like how that translates out is you really wanna get a mood board from them. You wanna have them assemble a document or at least a collection of images of the style um, that they're looking for and images that they love. And then part of that creative brief, you want to have a really detailed shot list of them, of big hero, high item things that they need to get done. And that could be specific, you know, products or, you know, item SKUs, uh, or it could just be like, we, you know, need filler landscape shots. So really just get them involved in honing out and ironing out that 
uh, that shot list. And those are things that just get them more involved and have them more ownership of it. Instead of just like, oh, like go shoot images, that's not enough directive. You wanna get them activated and feeling like they're a part of the process because they're not gonna be there on set with you to creative direct. So you really wanna cover your bases before you even start shooting so expectations are in sync and you can meet those expectations that they have. You wanna have that really focused shot list from the client before you begin. So that gives you a place to launch from. Like shoot those images, make sure you check those off. But the flow in the creative process of shooting is that as you start warming up, you get the creative mojo going and when you're out there on location, inspiration is gonna to come to you. And that's how, that's how inspiration comes to me. Uh, the place I start is an idea in my mind, but then I let the process take over a shooting, bring in other you know, inspirations from the physical environment, be the rocks or the sand or the water or, or the wind. And, but you have to begin somewhere. So that's, that's the way that I create for clients is like we have a shot list. I'm gonna make sure we get all those. And then I'm still gonna leave room and time for my own creative influence and inspiration to fill in all the gaps and make a bunch of extra images in between. And I think that's really when the photo magic happens. I mean, the, the, the truth of like the advertising world and photography is it's very fast moving and the pace is really quick. And a lot of times like you do pour your heart and soul and love into creating these images and you deliver them to the client and you like really never hear back again. And like a lot of times you do want to get, um, you know, praise and like, oh, we love this. And that just doesn't always happen. And it's nothing personal. It's not that they don't love them. It's just like, you're often just like one piece to like a very big puzzle that they're assembling for the campaign. Uh, but what I always try to do is even if I don't get the feedback from the client that I was hoping, like I always try to send a note of gratitude and thanks for getting hired for the project. And then it's like, hey, like if you guys end up using the images, like let me know where they land because I would love to see them. So I think it's just wise to remember to, you know, give the type of love that you want to receive and, you know, send in a note to a client um, after the shoot. Like that is just a great, it's a great idea. So the one thing I always want to establish with the client is you have to come up with a hard list deliverables of SKUs and products and hero shots that they're expecting. Like you have to get aligned on the big picture location. Are you shooting indoors? Are you shooting outdoors? You know, is it gonna be a clean white studio? Is it gonna be a natural space? Like are you shooting in a, you know, a welding shop or a barn? Or, you know, are you gonna be on the beach? So you have to hone in and get the big picture parameters set. So there's like an expectations. And really that's all about communication. And that's part of the pre-production conversations with the brands before you even uh, start scouting locations and taking images. The big workflow of these self-produced shoots is like you've gotten a brief uh, from the client that has the shot list, that has their uh, location um, preferences, uh, they've listed model requirements, um, like how many models and what type of models, what's the feeling of that. And then it's my job to go find the locations that I can shoot in. Um, and often I'm trying to pick locations that are, you know, free to photograph in that don't require permits that are kind of low overhead. And then I'm going to book my talent, their time and secure what the rate is gonna be with them. And I always try to be generous as I can with the talent and, all, and also very upfront and honest about what the usage is. Like you don't wanna have a job where you, you're shooting talent and it's a national cross country billboard campaign and they are unaware that that is what their face is gonna be on. You have to be really transparent about where the photographs are going. Uh, and then after I've picked the location and the talent, I'll communicate back with the, um, the brand or the agency of like where I think that the shoot would be great to have it at. And then I'll get approval for that. And then that's when I'll book, uh, officially book the talent's time and we'll go out into the world and start shooting. <clears throat> Some of the self-produced shoots that I do, um, often I'll do uh, pre-production 
location scout for the client. So, and this is after having a phone call or two with them to figure out if we're shooting indoors or outdoors. And a great example of this is I have a shoot coming up with Blundstone Boots and I'm delivering them 40 unique images and it's gonna be a product focused shoot. So it's not so much lifestyle, it's not so much, um, you know, people, you know, smiling, having a good time. It's really like honed in 50, 80 millimeter shots of the boots being worn in real environments. And uh, just to make sure that we're on the same page with expectations, I'll take the effort to go out with, you know, just my iPhone and secure a couple locations. For this, uh, some of my neighbors around me are in the trade. One of them is a welder and he has a really old, beautiful shop that's, you know, worn and dusty in the best way. So I just went in there, snapped a couple photographs of the space that I wanted to create in, and then you just email those off to the client to get approval of that's fitting their expectations. So then when you go shoot, uh, no one's disappointed when they see the files. So if you start to go into the space of doing self-produced shoots for clients, the, the big takeaways to remember are to have lots of conversations before you start shooting, to have your location approved, to have your town approved, and have that shot list really honed in so expectations are met and no one's disappointed when you're delivering files. And then whenever possible, just try to over deliver. So when it comes to the talent portion of um, shooting for commercial clients, the budget is going to determine who you can hire. Uh, and if you're shooting with friends um, or people that are part-time or just kind of filling in the gaps of their income or they enjoy doing whatever their reason is, um, you obviously need to be generous as you can with their, their time, their talent, and pay them as much as you can. And, on, and also be very upfront and clear about what the usage is gonna be of those files. And you obviously also need to have a model release and the brand of the agency might provide that or you know, there's lots of forms you know, that you can find online that cover your bases. And the biggest difference between shooting someone who maybe models part-time or um, you know, is attractive but doesn't have the skill set of professional model and modeling in itself is a craft just like Photography is a craft as well. So when I'm shooting people that are friends or not professional doing it full time, the biggest approach that I take is just to activate them, to give them really clear, concise direction of something, an action that, that I want them to take. Hey, grab your surfboard and pull it out of the pickup truck. Because a lot of my work is trying to capture um, real authentic feeling images. So like lifestyle brand photos, but you're doing it in a controlled way where you're not a fly on the wall documenting the world. You're creating these scenarios and these opportunities to make work. And a lot of times if someone's not a professional model, they can end up feeling a little stiff on camera or self-conscious just as I do when I get photographed because I don't, I'm not behind, I'm not in front of the lens all the time. So I'll, I'll tell the talent uh, an action to take. Hey, climb up that ladder. Um, come back down and do it again. And then having them repeat that same action helps them get a little bit looser. And when I'm shooting, there's going to be an in-between moment that captures that essence, that feeling of loose, of free, of not aware that the camera's there. Where a professional model, who you, you might have the budget to hire through a modeling agency, they have that gift and that innate talent to turn it on and act and just kind of fall into place. And you obviously still have to give a professional model direction, a goal, but that is the advantage of shooting someone uh, who, you know, who does it for a living. We're here on location and I want to take you all through my entire workflow process of how I do my self-produced commercial photo shoots for brands. And today uh, we're shooting uh, for Blundstone, which we're both wearing. And this is my wonderful friend and model, Soph, also amazing photographer. And of course, the amazing Maddie the Coonhound with big, thank you, with big <laughs> floppy ears. And 
What I like to do before I start shooting is just take a moment and sit down with the talent and go through a very high level list of shots that I want to capture that day. Just a one through 10. And there's going to be way more shots in between, but it's just that initial, initial conversation just to slow down. This is where we're going to begin from. And that just becomes like a way to make sure you're in sync with just expectations of what you hope to capture. So this is the, the big picture shot list that I wanna go through today. And of course, like in between all these ideas, there's gonna be a lot more images that we make. Cool. And you know, the way I like to work is if, if I kind of put milestones out or mile markers out, that'll give me a place to start from. So at least I have some direction. And then when we're shooting and walking through the landscape and the environment, you know, that's like just good moments to find more inspiration. So this is just really big picture place to start again but you know i want to uh shoot some images um on the rocks see where that takes us i want to make sure that we shoot some images around your pickup truck cool. and then with your pickup truck i want us to build a campfire mm -hmm. and then we'll shoot some images with your truck the campfire and with echo your Great. dog and then i want to uh, kind of round off and finish with loading and unloading your surfboard off the truck Great. awesome so the parameters that I set up for the shoot today to kind of give it structure and to leave room to still be inspired are, first of all, finding a great location to shoot in. And that's where we're at here today. We're at the ocean. So we have that background. We have the sand. We have out, outcropping of rocks and we have sand dunes. So like that's the, that's the, like the big structure. So we know where we're gonna be today. We're in a, we know where we're gonna be creating from and we have a bunch of variety. And the other one is obviously bringing in your talent. So for the model today, and it's still leaving room within those big parameters to be inspired. You know, after this like small pre-production meeting with your talent, which is, you know, going through the shot list, we've arrived here on location. The next step is you just have to start shooting and you have to lean into it. You got to take your camera out and you just have to start creating images. And that is what is going to begin the process of discovering what you want to say. And just in the back of your mind, just remembering you're going to have that shot list from the brand that's going to keep you on track so you're not overshooting or undershooting. I mean, there's, there's really not too much more to say about this. This is literally the moment where you've arrived, you're with your talent, you have to grab your camera, and you just have to go out in the world and let's just start shooting. So this is the hardest part about when uh, you're out on your photo shoot is that first step to actually begin creating photos. And, you know, we've taken quite a bit of energy and time and resources kind of assemble this together. And we have our talent here, you know, my camera's here. Even though it's not the perfect weather conditions, I still like to go ahead and start creating images because even if today I don't fully resolve all the ideas that I wanna capture, that's definitely gonna inform my photographs tomorrow when we get epic sunset. So the place that you just have to begin is just to try something. And again, I'm not worried about this initial process being fully resolved you just have to start shooting to get the creative energy and like the good feeling mojo inside of you to start leading you down the path to creating wonderful photographs so uh for these first photographs we're actually just going to focus on the product photography part of this which is going to be nice because the weather doesn't need to be the best it can be so we're talking about essentially the frame being almost all the boot so the place that we're gonna begin is just right here on these rocks. So, so if you could climb up there and let's just start shooting and see how it feels. Cool. So right then, you know, I gave her an action, something to execute, which was getting her to walk up the rock face. And I'm looking at how she's climbing that like a ladder to see if there's a photograph there. Uh, I know that I'm going to shoot this really low depth of field because I want to blow out that background as much as I can. And right now I'm just looking to see how it feels. And now, you know, you just have to put the camera up your eye. I've just set like on the, there we go, cool. Yeah, so like, I love the texture 
of the rocks. I like that it's wet right now, but she's standing just in a way that feels a little bit unnatural and it's kind of in between. So I think the place to go from here is like, let's make it feel even more unnatural, but self-aware. And here's what I mean by that is, so could you stand up with like your heels, both facing backwards? Yeah. And you just put your feet side by side, very intentionally. Yeah. So like, you know, that's kind of like very stiff, but it's aware that it's stiff. And yep, exactly. Actually, let's see the tag. So these are little details that you gotta be aware of. So yours got chewed off. But that's cool because this is all about the boots being worn and real. So we just embrace a, you know, a little, uh, you know, a little like that. So let's take this photograph. Okay, that's where we started from. So now Sophie and I have been working together for a minute. She's familiar with my camera. And now I'm just gonna have her reset the entire frame and we're gonna do it again. So could you jump down, Soph? Yeah. Climb down. <clears throat> oh, see, I just saw something that she did that I wanna take a photograph of. So she had both of her feet right here and it was that leap off. That felt good. So could you do that again? So that was something that I wasn't necessarily expecting to take an image of. It just happened because we're gonna kind of repeat the same frame a couple times. And I wanna get that kind of like stop motion. So we're gonna have our camera set to, you know, maximum burst, focus on our boots, and we're gonna shoot this a couple times. Well, I gotta find my, uh, my, uh, my focus dot. Yep, and action. Cool. But these also have to be good photos though for y'all to show on the screen. Oh my God, that's another layer. So I think giving direction to your talent, this is a really important thing to do, especially if they are, um, I don't know, I don't wanna be critical. If they're not professional models, you know, like you have to really give them an activity to do that activates them and helps you know, forget that the camera's there a little bit. And action. So can you like, um, it was like a thing of like a little two side by side when you jump it off, two perfect. <laughs> yeah, Once, are you, and hey, this is also an important thing. When you're asking your model to do something, sincerely check in with them to make sure the request you've made isn't hurting them or they're comfortable with it. So here we go. So was that okay jumping off that? Did you feel okay? Okay, cool. <laughs> that, I mean, that is quite important to do. It's easy to over ask because you're so dedicated and focused on getting the shot. So yeah, so if I think just like, you know, so now, okay, here's one problem we run to. We've become so aware that this is what we want. Now you can run into like some stiffness with the model and the interaction with the camera. So Steph, could you just take a couple steps back and then just kind of approach it and jump off whenever you feel good? Okay, one second. Okay, action. Yeah, that felt good. So, so that's kind of a, um, a scenario I wanna get. Now I'm just gonna really quickly check the images on my camera. Uh, I'm not gonna be hyper analyzing them. I just wanna try to vaguely figure out if I got the shot I'm looking for. And then after you get a shot, make sure you give some affirmation to your talent to let them know that they did a good job, that it felt good, you got the shot, because you have to keep the energy up. It's raining, it's a little windy, keep spirits high, you know? So this might be easy to see why I love this. We have the sand texture, we have the rocks, we have the green moss, we have the boots that we're focusing on, and these layers our photo goodness. And this is what we want to start shooting from and see if we can capture a really compelling image right here. So we've shot this frame a couple times. I love the sand. I love the green moss. I love the rock texture. Stuff is of course doing amazing. But what's happening is the boots are getting lost in the same color palette as the rocks. There's no pop. It's not coming off of the colors getting lost. We need some contrast. So, so has a wide variety of shoes with her because that's something that we uh, made plans for in pre-production before we got on location. So we're gonna get her to swap over to her yellow rubber boots that are super cute. 
and that will give us the contrast that we need. Yep. Yep, let's see what it looks like now. Yeah, look how much nicer that is. Oh, Echo. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, let's do it again. So I'm actually going to end up photographing this in, in two stages. This is this first step up, and then I'm going to do that long reach at the end. Oh, uh, yeah, that foot first is good. Okay, one second. Okay, and action. Cool. And then step back. Yep, one second, hold on. Okay, and action. And once more. And action. Cool. Bought it. <laughs> I'm a black dog. Cool. So the weather wasn't what we would have picked if we could have. Obviously, if we could have chosen an epic sunset, no wind, that's the day we would have chosen. But this is the day we've been given. And there's still an opportunity here to still make a compelling image, even though the weather isn't what we have chosen. So instead of trying to fight the weather, we're just gonna embrace it. So I'm looking out here across the ocean and all these puddles. We have sofa talent and these rubber boots. So like, let's not pretend that this is anything but like a gloomy day and let's just highlight the fact. So let's go take these contrasting yellow boots to the sand and let's just go splash in some puddles and see if we can make a little bit of fun and get a smile. Okay, and action. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. Okay, action. Okay, and action. Did you get really wet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. You know, I got a little... Oh my god, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's cool, cool. That's so fun, yeah. You know, we've been standing here in the wind and light rain, and much like that last scenario, where we're trying to embrace the weather. Let's embrace the wind. So it has amazing hair that's flapping the wind. And a lot of times when you're shooting for brands, you're not always shooting the one for one product. You're often trying to communicate a feeling and a mood. And that's what I want to do here. I want to really focus on, you know, the greater sense of place, of course, but her hair in the wind and then her relationship with her dog, uh, Echo. So, I'm thinking that we're going to get a photo of her walking in the wind, carrying Echo, and maybe just like a little twirl or a spin, just to get some like feelings at the beach. So our talent, so uh, what she just told me was that her dog Echo is 50 pounds and he gets heavy. So I'm going to save the hero part of this shot after I got a couple things resolved with her. So in the back of my mind, I know that I'm gonna want Echo in the shot in the end, maybe hopefully her holding him, but I don't wanna wear uh, Echo the dog out and I don't wanna wear our talent out. So let's just shoot with her at first. Okay, so I, like, I really love this reflection. So kind of what I'm thinking is like, you're gonna be holding the dog and you know, I kind of wanna catch this like spin moment, you know, your hair and the dog. Okay, so. Oh, we can we can wait for it. We'll just shoot it with you first. Yeah. Yeah. So in the spirit of embracing what life in the day brings us, and for us that is like windy, drizzly weather, we still want to try to make compelling images in this time that we have. And Thankfully, our talent, Soph, she was surfing before she came here, and on her truck, she brought a surfboard and her wetsuit, and, you know, this instantly became 
great material to photograph to make another image for this project. So if just drop your tailgate and I already see a couple of distracting elements in the frame that I want to make sure not in the final photograph. Like I see a mud flap and a dog toy and some other things. So we're just going to strike those from frame just to make sure they're not distracting in the image. So while uh, Soph is wrangling Echo, I'm noticing this little still light that I like a lot. We got the red brake light. We have the surfboard fins. We have the wetsuit dangling in the wind. Let's just go shoot this uh, really simple still life. So for me, this is very much like what I would call a B photograph, a filler image, where it's not the image that's gonna carry the lead. It's going to help expand the story, the sense of place, the visual narrative. Those kind of photographs are really important and also quite easy to capture as you're out shooting. So we got our final hero scene set back up. And this is just something to keep in mind when you're working with the animals. Sometimes you just have to let them run and be free and have, go have a good time. And so if just like threw the ball for five or 10 minutes um, for Echo, just to burn off some energy. And that's why often like the last component that I'll bring into the image is the animal itself. Let's get everything else resolved and lined up and then bring in the animal and start creating our photo. So this is our scene. And this is what we're going to try to create an image from. And we can, we can already see here that uh, Echo has gotten really snuggly and cozy. And we're just going to start shooting. And I know that I really want to convey the love between Soph and her dog Echo. So I'm just going to ask her the place to start is just give a little sweet kiss to the top of the head. Let's go there. So right now when I'm looking for the viewfinder, I'm just trying to balance comp the composition. I want the focus to be Soph an echo, but I also want to include the surfboard. I want to include uh, the wetsuit. We have the red taillights on. It's all coming together in a circular motion. Post the photo, cut the video, still image on frame. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You can see there, I was just hopping closer. That's the thing to remember. This is why you don't want to use a zoom lens shoot with prime lens because I'm not changing the way the photographs feel, I'm changing my relationship to the subject. So I want to bring Maddie into this final scenario. So Soph is going to go up the ladder. And again, when you're shooting animals, last component that you bring in, we are almost losing our sun here. That's that last few minutes of light I was talking about. Cool, I love Soph, what she's doing. The light here is amazing. Okay, I'm going to get Maddie in this frame, okay? Okay, we have Soph ready to go to bring the surfboard off. We have our sun setting. We have Maddie, the lovely coonhound. I have some very good pepperoni treats. And this is going to motivate Maddie to be a very good girl for us. <gasps> That's a sweet girl. OK, come on. OK, so if you're ready, come on up. OK, here you go. Stay, stay. So I'm going to put the treat where Maddie can get access to it. I'm going to tell her to get off. Maddie, get off, off, stay. There you go. That's a good, oh, there you go. You got it. And then just for this one photo, I'm going to do it again, but I'm put it on one rung higher where she won't quite be able to reach it. Stay, hold. Okay, so if you can go. 
Now to eat. Now to eat. Up. Okay, I love it. I got the wrong lens. I need to switch lenses. So I just need to switch to the 50 real quick. So did Maddie get the treat? Okay, so I'm gonna give Maddie the treat. Here you go, hold. Yeah, if you could put it back up there. Cool, one more. So just a variation. We're losing our light, but it's still beautiful. Oh, we got Echo. Hey, hey, hey. Echo, come here. Okay, so the action. Maddie, up. Echo, Echo. Up. Back up, Maddie. Echo, come here. Yeah, you can hold it right there. Echo, Echo. Come on. Echo, no, no, no. Come here. Come on. Echo. Echo, come on. Okay, you can take it off. Okay, you can take the board off. There we go. Oh, Maddie. Now we lost Maddie. Maddie, up. Go eat. Eat. Up. There we go. Okay. We got it. There's too much going on. I think we got it though. Hope you all enjoyed the workshop. Thank you so much, so for being the talent. Thank you. Thank you for Maddie the Coonhound, who's off wandering looking for treats. Um, it was my pleasure to try to teach you a little something of what I've been doing for the past 10 or 12 years of my life. I love photography, and I hope that you can take little pieces out of this and introduce them into your own workflow and keep growing as an image maker. Thank you so much. Peace.